1919, Winnipeg hit the big time. Newsreel reports flashed the city's name on the screens of thousands of theaters. Even sophisticated New Yorkers could start their day by reading about what was going on in Winnipeg. This was the kind of exposure the city's upbeat business community always dreamed of. But the reality seemed more like a nightmare. According to the papers, the Bolsheviks were about to take power in Winnipeg. Half the city was on strike. A revolution was just around the corner. Troops were called out. The usual suspects were rounded up and jailed, deported, or fired. After six weeks, the streets were once more safe for decent citizens, if they didn't make any false moves. Then the people who ran things in this town acted as if the whole thing never happened. Today, it's hard to find a trace of the general strike anywhere. Where's Victoria Park, where the strikers held their mass rallies? After the strike ended, the city put a steam plant on top of it. What about Market Square? It was the labor movement speaker's corner. Today, it's a police station. In 1969, a union presented the city with a plaque commemorating the strike's 50th anniversary. Many councillors were horrified. They said such a disgraceful moment in the city's history was best forgotten. So what was so scary about the Winnipeg General Strike? After all, the strikers weren't armed. The most revolutionary thing they did was make sure that bread and milk continued to be delivered through the strike. The men and women of the General Strike Committee hardly look like subversives. And if they wanted to smash the state, why did they ask the police department to stay on the job? So what is it these people wanted us to forget? Simply put, the Winnipeg General Strike is a breathtaking example of solidarity and sacrifice on the part of the working people of Winnipeg. For six weeks, they seized the city's imagination. The strike started on the morning of May 15, 1919. The night shift of telephone operators put their last calls through and pulled the plug. There would be no day shift. The Hello Girls were not making any demands for themselves. They struck to support the building trades and metal shops workers. These workers had been on strike for two weeks. The key issue for them was union recognition. Manitoba Bridge Works manager Tom Deacon said he was willing to set up a shop committee as long as he got to pick half the members. At the Vulcan Iron Works, Edward Barrett vowed never to take orders from a union. Across the city, workers rallied to the strike call. In garment factories, packing houses, binderies, rail yards, breweries, brick yards and offices, workers all began to down their tools, close the tills, and shutter the windows. By the end of the day, over 90 unions were on strike. Within a few days, as many as 32,000 men and women had left their jobs. Over half of them were not even union members. That is what middle-class Winnipeg found so threatening about the Winnipeg General Strike. Winnipeg businessmen were used to breaking strikes and crushing unions. Some of them did it annually. But the fact that half of the people involved in the General Strike were not members of any union was a new threat. It showed that Winnipeg workers had come to see themselves as common allies. Most of them had emigrated here in the past two decades. They were as burdened as we are with racism and prejudice, but they were beginning to see past those divisions. Already, they were far more than anonymous members of a labor market. They were a working class. They lived together in the same parts of the city, endured the same slums, saw their children die from the same lack of sanitation. They read the same papers, experienced the same workplace dangers, and were even starting to vote for the same candidates. This was solidarity. 
That sense of community was on display every day during the general strike. One sees it in the faces of the workers who turned out at Victoria Park. The returned soldiers who paraded in support of the strike were part of this community. And from solidarity comes the strength for self-sacrifice. The sacrifice of a 17-year-old waitress who left her first job because it was the right thing to do. This sense of comradeship inspired rail workers with years of seniority to risk their jobs so that all machinists could belong to a union. The Labour Minister ordered postal workers to go back to work or lose their jobs. The posties marked the threat, returned to sender, and stood by their co-workers. The police officers refused to repudiate the strikers, and for their courage, they were told to turn in their badges. The strike was hardly the beginning of the Canadian Revolution. Workers were simply asking for the collective bargaining rights most unions enjoy today. But Winnipeg's business leaders would not tolerate any challenges. They formed themselves into a citizen's committee of 1,000. Young men from the university were recruited into a vigilante police force. They were armed with clubs and sent into the streets. The citizens committee was soon giving orders to city council, the employers, and the federal government. They were the central committee which seized power in 1919. After five weeks, they arranged to have the strike leaders arrested. When veterans protested, the mounted police broke up their demonstration. One man was dead. Another would die within days. Dozens more were wounded or in jail. The message was clear. The machine guns would stay on the streets as long as necessary. Within days, the return to work had begun. But the sense of solidarity and sacrifice continued. The court sent the strike leaders to jail. In the next elections, the workers sent them to the legislature and parliament. New political parties, unions, and working-class institutions all took root in North Winnipeg. After decades of struggle, many of the strikers' goals were realized. But their strong sense of working-class community has been muted. It has been drowned out by a new commercial culture. But the sharp edges of class conflict can't always be kept below the surface. When push comes to shove, the government and business community make it clear that they have not forgotten the lessons of 1919. And that is why it is important for workers to hold on to the memory of the strike. For an event like the Winnipeg General Strike is never really lost unless it is forgotten. Today, new solidarities are being forged and fresh sacrifices demanded. The memory of six weeks of solidarity in the summer of 1919 can be a precious resource in these struggles. For if their sentence is our sentence, our sacrifices and our solidarities will be their victory.